month of May saw the militia bungle in their attempt to coerce Black Hawk into submission and the unleashing of continuous Indian raids on settlers in northern Illinois. Two sisters, Rachel and Sylvia Hall, were captured during one of these attacks. General Henry Atkinson and Indian agent Henry Gratchett offered $2,000 in reward money to the Winnebago to act as mediators in ransoming the girls. After much debating and some bribery, Winnebago Chief White Crow succeeded in obtaining custody of the Hall sisters and began escorting them on a 60-mile journey from Lake Koshkonong to Blue Mounds. Rachel Hall later recalled the event of her and her sister's release on June 3rd. The blind and his son left our encampment during the night and returned early in the morning. Immediately afterward they came to us, and the blind asked if we thought the whites would hang them if they took us to the fort. We told them they would not. They next inquired if we thought the white people would give them anything for taking us to them. We told them they would. The blind then collected his horses, and with the whirling thunder and about twenty of the Winnebago's, we crossed the river and pursued our journey, my sister and myself each on a separate horse. We encamped about dark, rose early next morning, and after a hasty meal of pork and potatoes, the first we had since our captivity, of which we ate heartily, we traveled on until we reached the fort, the Blue Mounds. Before our arrival thither, we had become satisfied that our protectors were taking us to our friends, and that we had formerly done them injustice by our mistrust of their intentions. About three miles from the fort we stopped, and the Indians cooked some venison, after which they took a white handkerchief, which I had, and tying it to a long pole, three Indians proceeded with it to the fort. About a quarter of a mile from thence we were met by a Frenchman. That so-called Frenchman was Canadian-American Edward Beauchard, the sub-agent under Henry Gratchett. Upon Beauchard's arrival, the Winnebago expressed an unwillingness to give up the Hall sisters until they could see Gratchett, who was not at the fort. Beauchard eventually convinces White Crow and his band that they will be safe at the fort and will receive compensation that is owed to them. So after many days suffering from grief of losing parents and family, captivity, little rest or food, forced marches, and experiencing a culture shock that would change the outlook on their lives, the Hall sisters regained their freedom. For those at Fort Blue Mounds, the war had suddenly appeared at their gate. Militiaman John Messersmith recalls, The people in the fort discovered Indians showing themselves at the edge of the timber about three miles east of the fort. Beauchard bravely volunteered to go out and ascertain who they were. He did so and found that they were Winnebago's and that they had brought the captured girls with them. He soon brought the Indians to the fort and they delivered up the unhappy and almost destitute captives to the ladies who were in the fort, who received them and assisted them, as might be well expected, to the utmost of their abilities. Half famished, half naked, the unfortunate captives found themselves once more in a civilized life and among friends. By choice or by chance, Colonel Henry Dodge is never far from the center of action. Dodge and his mounted men arrive half an hour after the girls enter the fort. Dodge takes the opportunity to further cement the alliance with the Winnebago, which he began to form at councils held in May. Dodge gives the Winnebago a beef steer for a large feast and lodges them in the miners' cabins. What happens next is rather controversial, but is supported by primary sources. Although White Crow had just risked his own life to ransom Rachel and Sylvia Hall and deliver them to the Whites, White Crow and his band leave the fort and begin grinding their knives, tomahawks, and spears. White Crow is overheard calling Dodge no great shakes of a fighter and says that Black Hawk will make mincemeat out of him as he had of Stillman that the whites would not stand at the yell of the Indians, but would run like turkeys and quail, and when speared, they would squawk like ducks. But White Crow warns his friend, Henry Gratchett's brother, J.P.B. Gratchett, to leave and go home, that he was friendly to him, and advised him to quit Colonel Dodge, go home, and stay there. But instead of fleeing, Gratchett runs to the fort and warns Dodge. 
Messer Smith recalls what happens next. Colonel Dodge heard these reports without saying a word, but no one, says an eyewitness, could mistake the raging storm within his breast. He jumped to his feet as his informant ended, and although ordinarily cool and collected, he indulged upon the occasion in some severity and invective. Do not be alarmed, he said. I will see that no harm befalls you in case of an attack. I will stand by you until the last drop of blood is spilt. I will show the white crow that we are not of the soft-shelled breed, that we can stand the spear without squawking, that we will not run and stick our heads in the bush. Dodge then called the officer of the guard and his interpreter, and taking with them six of the guard, went to where the Indians were, and took White Crow and five others of his band into custody, marched them to a cabin, and ordered them to lie down and remain there until morning. Dodge himself lay down by them, having first placed a strong guard around the cabin, and a double guard around the whole encampment. The next day Dodge marches the Winnebago to Morrison's Grove, intending to discourage an attack on Fort Blue Mounds. On June 5th, Dodge gives them a talk and accuses the Winnebago of being supporters of Black Hawk. Holding them captive, Dodge demands assurances that they will at least remain neutral in the conflict. White Crow responds by saying that only a few younger men had joined Black Hawk and that the rest of the Winnebago were in truth friendly to the whites. Dodge releases White Crow and the Winnebago but holds Whirling Thunder, Spotted Arm, and Little Priest as hostages at Gratchet's Grove until the end of the month. Many believe the sudden action prevents a large-scale attack on the mineral district by the Winnebago. Yet the ensuing events suggest that Dodge has offended and angered the Winnebago by capturing their leaders. On June 6th, William Aubrey and Jefferson Smith depart Fort Blue Mounds to retrieve water from a spring on Ebenezer Brigham's property, when a small party of warriors ambushes them. Aubrey is shot twice and stabbed through the neck with a spear. Smith is shot three times. He drops a pistol borrowed from Brigham and loses his horse, but manages to escape with his life. The defenders prepare for an attack, but none comes. The settlers realize that the attackers are the local Winnebago and not the warriors of Black Hawk's British band. How many Winnebago will rise up against the newcomers in Wisconsin? The sudden killings bring fear and tension to the fort, and everyone is put on edge. They begin to turn on each other. Beauchard recalls, When Captain Aubrey was killed, I started out from the fort by myself to get his body. I had asked Lieutenant George Force to go with me to get the body, but he refused to go, and I told him if he got killed and was only six feet off, I would not go for his body. Before he hears of the attack at Blue Mounds, Dodge travels through the anxious mineral district, recruiting men and overseeing the supply and construction of settler forts. In an uncertain time, the settlers find a sure hope and true hero in Dodge. He understands the values and fears held by the settlers and miners in the frontier. Dodge appeals to their patriotism and pride in their nation. The United States of America, an experiment in democracy, at that time was only 50 years old. Dodge gives a speech to rally the men and increase their morale. We have met to take the field. The tomahawk and scalping knife are drawn over the heads of the weak and defenseless inhabitants of our country. Although the most exposed people in the United States and territories, living as we do surrounded by savages, not a drop of blood of the people in this part of the territory has been shed. Let us unite, my brethren in arms. Let harmony, union, and concert exist. Be vigilant, silent, and cool. Discipline and obedience to orders will make small bodies of men formidable and invincible. Without order and subordination, the largest bodies of armed men are no better than armed mobs. We have everything dear to freemen at stake, the protection of our frontiers, the lives of our people. Although we have the entire confidence in the government of our choice, Knowing that ours is a government of the people, where the equal rights of all are protected, and the power of our countrymen can crush the savage foe, yet it will take time for the government to direct a force sufficient to give us security and peace to the frontier people. I have, gentlemen, as well as yourselves, entire confidence both in the President of the United States and the present distinguished individual at the head of the War Department. Our Indian relations are better understood by them than by any two citizens who could be selected to fill their stations. 
They have often met our savage enemies on the field of battle, where they have conquered them, as well as in council. They understand the artifice, cunning, and stratagem for which our enemies are distinguished. They know our wants, and will apply the remedy. In General Atkinson, whose protection this frontier is placed, I have entire confidence. You will recollect the responsibility he assumed for the people of this country in 1827, by ascending the Wisconsin with 600 infantry and 150 mountain men, to demand the murderers of our people. Many of us had the honor of serving under him on that occasion. He has my entire confidence both as a man of talents in his profession, a soldier, and a gentleman. If our government will let them retain the command, he will give us a lasting peace that will ensure us tranquility for years. He knows the resources as well as the character of the Indians we have to contend with. Let the government furnish him the means, and our trouble will be short duration. What, my fellow soldiers, is the character of the foe we have to contend with? They are a faithless banditti of savages who have violated all treaties. They have left the country and the nation of which they form a part. The policies of these marauders and robbers of our people appears to be to enlist the disaffected and restless of other nations, which will give them strength and resources to murder our people and burn their property. They are the enemies of all people, both white and Indians. Their thirst of blood is not to be satisfied. They are willing to bring ruin and destruction on other Indians, in order to glut their vengeance on us. The humane policy of this government will not apply to these deluded people. Like pirates of the sea, their hand is against every man, and the hand of every man should be against them. The future growth and prosperity of our country is to be decided for years by the policy that is now to be pursued by the government in relation to the Indians. Our existence as a people is at stake, and gentlemen, great as the resource of our government are, the security of the lives of our people depends on our vigilance, caution, and bravery. The assistance of our government may be too late for us. Let us not await the arrival of our enemies at our doors, but advance upon them, fight them, watch them, and hold them in check. Let us avoid surprise and ambuscades. Let every volunteer lie with his arms in his hands, ready for action so that when each arises to his feet, the line of battle will be formed. If attacked in the night, we will charge the enemy at a quick pace and even front. Let the eyes of the people be upon us. Let us endeavor by our actions to retain the confidence and support of our countrymen. According to Dodge, this war is a war of survival. There is no gray area. Black Hawk and his band have no moral standing or claim whatsoever. As Dodge rides through the Mineral District, he continues to recruit men and inspect garrisons. On June 8th, Dodge and Captain James Stephenson of Galena find and bury victims of the St. Drain Massacre, whose mutilated bodies have been left in the open for days. On June 12th, Dodge escorts old General Hugh Brady from Dixon's Ferry to the mouth of the Fox River to confer with overall commander General Henry Atkinson at Fort Ottawa. There, they will organize the army into three brigades and work on a strategy to trap and destroy the British band. That same day in Washington, D.C., President Andrew Jackson is agitated by the lack of progress reports from Atkinson. Relying on peripheral sources, it takes some time for a full picture to develop. When it is clear that the regular army has made no contact with the hostile Indians under Black Hawk, the militia has only suffered a humiliating defeat, and that successful raids on settlers has encouraged members of additional tribes to join Black Hawk, Jackson is incensed. Earlier in the year, Jackson had issued instructions with the intent to speed along the process of removing all Native Americans to the west side of the Mississippi. Now it seems as if one man, Black Hawk, is getting away with removing himself back across the river. His actions are an example Jackson doesn't want the other tribes to follow. Black Hawk needs to be stopped and turned back. Jackson fires off a reprimand through the War Department to Atkinson. Sir, information has reached the department from Dixon's Ferry, Hennepin, Rock Island, Chicago, Detroit, Galena Prairie du Chien, and St. Louis of the movements, depredations, and murders committed by the hostile Indians upon the frontiers but nothing has been received from you since the 10th of May. 
I am directed by the President to say that he views with utter astonishment and deep regret this state of things. Orders were forwarded to you on the 5th of May to call upon the Governor of Illinois for such a force as you might deem necessary to drive the Indians across the river, and if they would not surrender the murderers of the Menominees who are assumed a hostile attitude, after having recrossed, to forthwith attack and chastise them. A force sufficient has been acting with you in the field for some past days to have effected the object of your expedition. The President has a right to anticipate promptness and decision of action and a speedy and effectual termination of Indian hostilities and the capture or death of Black Hawk, the principal agent in the work of death, desolation. Someone is to blame in this matter, but upon whom it is to fall, it is at present unknown to the Department. The President directs your particular attention to the subject of this communication and instructs me to say that Black Hawk and his party must be chastised in a speedy and honorable termination put to this war, which will hereafter deter others from the like unprovoked hostilities by Indians upon our frontiers. John Robb, Acting Secretary of War A few days later, President Jackson, tired of the inaction of General Atkinson, directs Secretary of War Lewis Cass to replace Atkinson as the commander of the Army of the Frontier with War of 1812 hero Major General Winfield Scott. Cass instructs Scott at Fortress Monroe to proceed without delay to Chicago and assume the command of the regular troops and militia in the service of the United States, operating on the frontiers of Illinois and Michigan against the hostile Indians. While Atkinson earns a scolding from the President, the man of action is on the move once again. On June 14th, Dodge dismisses his volunteers after eight hard days of patrols. Yet Dodge takes no rest, but goes to Fort Blue Mounds, then proceeds to Fort Hamilton. He is a man who personally investigates the readiness and supply of these frontier forts. Dodge sends for more provisions from Galena. He does not know where the British band will strike next. Each fort must be ready to fight to the death. While Dodge wants everyone to be on high alert, it is impossible for the settlers to simply wait inside a stockade until danger passes. On June 14th from Fort Hamilton, a man named Spafford and six men go out to work in his farm a few miles away. Perhaps they should have been more cautious, but people will need food with or without Black Hawk. Besides, the closest attacks so far had been almost 30 miles away. There hadn't been any local signs or warnings to deter Spafford. Yet this isolated group was a perfect target for one of the war parties Black Hawk sent out to distract the main American army and gather supplies. When the warriors attacked, the settlers found themselves trapped with their backs to the Pecatonica River. Spafford is quickly killed. Two others were shot as they attempted to swim across the river. One man named Spencer ran along the bank and shot and killed a pursuer. He then hid in the woods. The only other survivor, Bennett Million, drove into the river and never surfaced until he reached the other side. In an amazing physical feat, he then jumped up the 12-foot river bank in one bound. Million later recalled his remarkable escape. After getting upon the bank, I found two balls had passed through my shirt. Two others passed so near me that their force was felt in my face. My hat was afterwards found with a large hole near the band. The effort of diving the river, leaping the bank, had so exhausted and addled me that I thought I was shot. After going about sixty yards in a walk, I stopped and examined myself. Finding I was not shot, I took fresh courage and commenced my flight for my life and arrived safe at Fort Hamilton in about three quarters of an hour. Word of the attacks is quickly sent to other forts in the area. A courier, bloody with spurring, arrives at Fort Defiance around sundown. While the news is quickly relayed to Colonel Dodge at Fort Union, a detachment of reinforcements is sent to Fort Hamilton to bury the body. Lieutenant Charles Bracken, who later claims he had command of the burial force, recalls the scene of death that greeted him. The first object that presented itself was the headless body of Spafford. Like a lion at bay, he died covered with a hundred wounds. The bodies of McGillwain and John Bull were taken out of the river. They had been scalped and most horribly mutilated. Having performed the melancholy duty of burying the dead, we returned to Fort Hamilton. It was agreed that if Colonel Dodge did not arrive at the fort by eight o'clock the next day, the officers and men would take the trail 
and pursue the Indians. So far, the Whites could neither defend themselves from attack nor eliminate any of the war bands that threatened them. All this is about to change. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. In the comments below, share which individual you find most interesting and why.